On today's episode of What's Going On With Shipping, we have a Red Sea update. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to today's episode. So obviously it's time for a Red Sea update, a lot going on in and around the region. No better time to do it than now. The third year anniversary of the grounding of Ever Given in the Suez. I was mistaken. Our first video for this channel actually took place the day afterwards. So on tomorrow, Sunday, uh, March 22nd, I will do a live Q&A at 12 noon Eastern time. So tune in for that. I'll have the video information up and posted one hour. Uh, if you got questions and answers, please send them forward early so I can take a look at them. Always hard to do it on a live Q&A. So I'm going to be trying to field questions from people who have been watching this channel now for over three years. There are a lot of longtime subscribers to the channel. All right, let's go ahead and jump into today's update. All right, today's update, this comes from the Maritime Administration. They just issued a new advisory. This is on the Southern Red Sea, the Bab El Mandeb. If you wonder what we drink here at what's going on with shipping, we drink freedom. That's right. Freedom. Uh, the running joke here at what's going on with shipping is every time we say Bob L. Mandab, we have to have a drink. Uh, Maybe hammered by the end of this episode. So, uh, Gulf of Aden, Indian Ocean, Somali Basin, Arabian Sea, Gulf of Oman, Straits of Hormuz, and Persian Gulf. Okay. We mark all those areas on our globe here with red dots. Uh, not enough red dots here to basically get them in here, but there's a lot of areas of contention. Let's take a look at what Marad is talking about. What are the five big issues that they have identified? So the first issue they have is the Houthis and their hostile action. This is commercial ships transiting through the Southern Red Sea, the Bab El Mandeb, <laughs> Gulf of Aden, and it continues to be at an elevated risk of terrorism and other hostile actions by the Houthi. And they go through a very lengthy explanation here. I, of course, have this linked into the show notes so you can take a full look at it. But they really detail all the events that have transpired since November 19th. They're talking about over 47 separate attacks affecting over 55 nations. Second, they talk about Iranian illegal boarding, detention, and seizure of vessels. Let's remember that the Iranians are currently holding a ship right now that they seized that was sailing out of the Persian Gulf. And they have done that time and time again. Now, on the flip side, the U.S. has also seized vessels going out and around. Those are ships carrying Iranian oil that are basically under U.S. sanctions. So this has been a continued back and forth between those two sides. Third, we're seeing piracy and armed robbery against ships. Uh, these are recent attacks, and we're going to talk about one here in a second that was foiled by the Indian Navy. But we're seeing them in and around the Gulf of Aden, the Arabian Sea, the Somali Basin, and out in the Indian Ocean. And then the last two are warnings about UAVs, unmanned aerial uh, vehicles that are being used to attack vessels outside the Southern Red Sea. The Bab El Mandeb. <laughs> I'm telling you. I may need a liver transplant after this episode. The Gulf of Aden and these UAV attacks also pose a threat to commercial shipping in and around the Persian Gulf, Straits of Hormuz, Gulf of Oman, and Arabian Sea. And then the last one deals with limpet mines. Although we haven't seen these attacks recently, they had been a series of attacks that had been executed by the Iranians against shipping. If you want a breakdown on all shipping attacks, and these are shipping attacks since 2019, there is a great site I will have the link to here, Tracking Maritime Attacks in the Middle East Since 2019. This is from the Washington Institute. It is a very well done uh, breakdown of all the attacks with locations, types of vessels, uh, all the details you would want. Great reference site to have. That along with the European Union's uh, site that is tracking vessels, probably two of the best out there right now for being able to decipher through all these attacks. Second, let's talk about the Indian Navy and their role. They just put out this video, and I gotta say, the Indian Navy is not only great at what they're doing in terms of deterring piracy, but their public relations are just fantastic. So here are some images of them uh, taking back the Rwan, some images of, first of all, distance over 1,400 miles from India, this operation take place. This is the view from on board a Indian uh, C-17 and the deployment of their Marine Commandos, MARCOMs. 
coming out to assist in the retaking of the Ruan. Just some great imagery here that you're getting uh, parachuting in from 6,000 feet. <laughs> Let me be clear about something. There are many things I will do. Uh, I've been a volunteer firefighter for 25 years, but one of the things I'm not going to do is jump out of a perfectly good airplane. I don't like the fear of falling at all. I don't mind rappelling. I love going up on ladders. I have no problem with heights. I just don't like falling. But these, and they're jumping into water, and I can't talk about the, the risk associated with this uh, a lot in this. Uh, just an absolute fantastic operation executed by the Indian Navy. One of the things that you're seeing in here do is, uh, even though it looks like that the Indian Navy was able to get the pirates to kind of kick back and, and, and surrender, you still have to, as they call it here, sanitize the vessel. You have to go through deck by deck, room by room, and the ship is a big issue. You see them here on the bridge looking in compartments, probably looking for bombs and other devices. So it takes a lot to be able to clear a vessel to ensure that it is safe. Here they are with uh, the pirates on board. You'll see them removing the pirates, transferring, transferring them over to the destroyer Kolkata. Kolkata is going to deliver those pirates back to India for prosecution. So this video here does a great job in demonstrating the ability of the Indian Navy. So in case you're wondering what justification or what authority the Indian Navy has, well, under Article 105 of the UN uh, Convention on the Law of the Seas, it gives the right to ships and uh, uh, nations to do this. So Article 105 on the high seas or in any other place outside the jurisdiction of any state, so in other words, in international waters, every state may seize a pirate ship or aircraft or a ship or aircraft taken by piracy and under the control of piracies and arrest the persons and seize the property on board. The court of the state which carried out the seizure may decide upon the penalties to be imposed and may also determine the action to be taken with regard to the ships, aircraft, or property subject to the rights of third parties acting in good faith. So under UNCLAUS, which every nation on the planet has basically signed, except for the United States, India has the right to seize the vessels and now they can prosecute them in Indian courts. And it just so happens that last year, India passed the Maritime Anti-Piracy Act of 2022. It was passed on 31 January of 2023. This is to give them the legal justification and mechanisms to prosecute under that article of UNCLAUS. And in case you're wondering what the punishment for piracy is in India, whoever commits any act of piracy shall be punished, one, with imprisonment which may extend to imprisonment for life or with fine or with both or under number two with death or with imprisonment for life if such person is committing the act of piracy causes death or an attempt thereof i think the indian navy is being extremely proactive in trying to curtail piracy especially before monsoon season kicks in so they're trying to deter the somalis from coming out and seizing vessels uh, there is rumors and stories afloat that the Indians are looking to take back the Abdullah, which is the most recent pirated vessel, but that is in Somali waters, and they can't technically violate Somali waters without the authority of the Somali government, which may be in the works. We just don't know. But definitely the Indian Navy is on a tear here across the region in helping fight fires on board Marlon Luanda, MSC Sky 2, and now the retaking of MV Ruand with no injuries and the crew, the original crew that was operating the vessel taken back. A lot of questions about why Ruan was out at sea. Was it operating as a mothership? I can't think of any reason you would have 30-something pirates on board a vessel sailing out in the, in the middle of the Indian Ocean unless you were acting as a mothership, but it's a terrible mothership, except for the fact that no one would attack it, except the Indian Navy. Next, we get an update from Maersk Lines regarding transiting of the region. Now, if you remember, Maersk was the very first company that diverted around the region because of the Houthi attacks. Did that on March 15th after an attack on a Maersk vessel. They then attempted to resume transits uh, toward the end of the year, late December. Then a series of attacks were executed uh, at the end of December and even in January against U.S. flagged Maersk vessels. And that's really started the wave where we saw the removal of major 
companies not going through the region. Let's be clear. The reason they're going through isn't so much the Houthi attacks. It's the fact that the Houthi attacks are raising war risk insurance costs. It is too cost prohibitive for ships to go through. Maersk said here, over the recent weeks, European Union security operation Aspides has taken shape and we welcome this as a very positive de development to increase the safety in the region and reduce in the future of the risk of threat to the vessels passing through the Red Sea and the Bab el Mandab. Cheers. Straight, specifically, we are in continuous dialogue with the representatives of this joint operation. We monitor the development. We hope that it will, together with other initiatives already ongoing, Operation Prosperity Guardian, as well as future ones, enable the safe return. Regrettably, both our internal analysis as well as our insight we are received from external sources still indicate the high risk level in the region remains elevated. We have seen attacks on commercial ships increase in numbers, including the tragic attack on the vessel True Confidence. This is the one that lost three crew members on board and the sinking of Ruby Mar. These incidents unfortunately highlight the lethal effectiveness of missiles currently used by the Houthi attackers and are one of the reasons for the elevated security risk we have in place at the moment. So, Understand, while we are seeing the United States and the United Kingdom wage an offensive campaign to neutralize Houthi missiles, this is Poseidon Archer, it is not working in the, in the scheme that there are still attacks being executed. While they are destroying drones and missiles on the ground in Yemen, you are not deterring the Houthi from their launches. And matter of fact, the most recent press out is that the Houthis now have more advanced missiles, hypersonics, that can reach even further out. And what that means is the ocean carriers who have to pay the war risk insurance are not going to go through. Now, if national states who have the registries want to help defer the war risk, we may see some shipping go through. I think that's what we were seeing with a company like CMA CGM that is a French national line, even though the ships are not French uh, uh, flagged, they are French owned and therefore we were seeing French vessels escort them. And I think we were seeing probably a better deal on their war risk insurance. We're not seeing that. So you're not gonna see the major ocean carriers re returning back to the region. At the same time, you have this story from Bloomberg, which I have to question just a bit because the sourcing for this story is not the strongest. But this story from Bloomberg, Yemen-based Houthis have told Russia and China their ships can sail through the Red Sea in the Gulf of Aden without being attacked, according to several people with knowledge of the militant group's discussion. Okay, that's very vague. It's not very specific. However, China and Russia reached an understanding following talks between their diplomats in Oman and Mohammed Abdel Salam, one of the Houthis' top political figures, said the people, who asked not to be named. In exchange, the two countries may provide political support to the Houthis in bodies such as the UN Security Council, according to the people. It's not entirely clear how the support would be manifest, but it would include blocking more resolutions against the group. Okay, there has been this talk that Russian and Chinese ships have not been attacked. Let's be clear, they have been attacked. There have been attacks on Hong Kong flagships. There have been attacks on ships carrying Russians. However, there is a concept here that China and Russia may be providing intelligence on what are Russian Chinese vessels. In other words, what ships not to attack. Uh, which, in, in, in a case, you can make the argument that the Chinese and Russians are then giving the go-ahead to attack other vessels. If they are clearly identifying what ships not to attack, that raises the other vessels as targeted vessels. So this is a interesting development. Again, the sourcing is not the greatest on this, but we've seen this happening. It also means that the U.S. Navy, the British Navy, and all the other ones involved in Operation Prosperity Garden and the Speedis are actually helping to protect Chinese and Russian vessels sailing through, while the Chinese and Russians are providing nothing in security uh, for the protection of the ships. So again, another strange development in this story. Finally, we get this from UNCTAD, uh, the UN uh, uh, Conference on Trade and Development, their global trade update for March of 2024. Global trade downturn in 2023 expected to give way to growth in 2024. The value of merchandise trade declined by 5% in 2023 and in service uh, in trade and services increased by 8%. During 2023, trade of developing countries uh, and South-South trade performed worse than global averages. Trade in environmental products increased during 2023. They're talking about things like electric vehicles. And then the outlook for 2024 is positive, but geopolitical issues and shipping disruptions increase uncertainties. 
I don't want to look at the entire report. I just want to highlight several issues. Of course, I'll have the link to the report in the show notes. So after a decline through 2023, trading goods is expected to slightly increase in Q1 first quarter of 2024. And you can see that with services annual growth, we're seeing goods quarterly growth going up. We're seeing goods annual growth starting to come up from a negative. And we're seeing services quarterly growth also increase. When you look at trade volumes, which bottomed out in the second quarter of 2020, I wonder what happened in the second quarter of 2020. I can't seem to remember now. But what we've seen is the values of cargo have increased and the volume of trade has continued to increase above what it was set in the first quarter of 2019. So they have six points they make in this. Number one, the positive economic growth, but with significant disparity. So we're seeing positive growth, but again, there's going to be some fluctuations across. There's strong demand for container shipping and raw materials. Commodity prices are still extremely volatile. We're seeing the lengthening of supply chains because of disruptions and diversions. We're seeing the increase in subsidies and trade restrictive measures. Much more protectionism is at foot around the world today. And we're still seeing shipping route disruptions. And what I thought was the most interesting table in this chart was this one. Bilateral trade patterns reflect continuing geoeconomic tensions. So if you look where trade dependencies are increasing, one of the biggest is the growth of dependency between Russia and China. Russia is providing a lot of energy and to China, which is making China dependent on it, 7.1% increase. Same on the flip side, Ukraine is becoming a, a, a dependent uh, for the European Union, an increase of 5.8%. Even Brazil is shipping more to China. This is in grain and other commodities. Uh, the United Kingdom is tied a little closer to the European Union at 1.6%. If you look at decreasing trade uh, dependencies, well, obviously Russia to the European Union, that's down 5.3%. It was down much larger per, uh, from 2022 to 2023. And then Korea down to China, 1.2%. And the U.S. down to China 1.2%. But again, got to be careful with that stat because we're seeing a well, we're seeing a decrease in the number of containers, for example, coming into the U.S. We are seeing an increase in containers going into Mexico from China, and we have an increase in containers coming from Mexico to the U.S. So are those containers just stopping in Mexico and then coming through? We don't know. Well, I hope you enjoyed the update we had today for the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf, uh, the Indian Ocean, the Arabian Gulf, and what was that one other place? That's right, Bob El Mandeb. I'm going to have to run to the store and stock back up. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? Well, you can give the page a big thumbs up. You can hit that super thanks button down below, and you can become a patron of the page, either monthly or yearly. Uh, I can't tell you how excited I am to be having the third anniversary of this channel tomorrow when John Conrad and I actually had our very first video together talking about Ever Given stuck in the Suez. I'm going to repost that video for everyone to look at, see where this this whole mess started uh, and where we've been over the course of three years. Over 205,000 subscribers 35 million views uh it, it is it is it is I, I can't i don't even have words for it anymore i just don't it, it is just surreal and i appreciate everybody who tunes in watches this channel supports this channel and i look forward to keeping this up for as long as i can so until our next episode of the south sign off